Well, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with Steve Fenves and talk with him about his amazing career. But Steve and I are good friends, have been friends for a long time. In fact, uh, dating back uh, some 30, 40 years ago, we were in a carpool together. We were both faculty members at the Carnegie Mellon uh, University. And for five years, every day, we rode the work and back. And it was just fascinating to, to talk uh, here. I was doing the listening most of the time about uh, his, his amazing uh, background of him and his colleagues. Uh, but we're great to have you here today, Steve. And uh, look, I have some questions I'd like to ask you about your career. Yeah, well, that was a very enjoyable time. Uh, you were not quiet at all. <laughs> uh, you. We're still chafing at the, some of the university regulations, and the and two of us uh, senior to you had to defend the, the place. <laughs> but it was a great time. And the, the parties you and Pat threw, uh, to which the entire carpool was also invited, that was a great annual event. It was a fascinating time for me. And uh, yeah, I realized you know, I, I, f I had the young person's disease of thinking I knew too much. But I've gotten over that and been cured. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's great to have you. I, the, most, um, the first question I want to ask you, which is the most important question, I think, is how and where did you meet Norma? Ah, yes. First question always asked. Uh, I came to the States in 50, was drafted in 52, came out in 53, and uh, I started school at U University of Illinois. And between semesters, I stayed at my sister's home on the south side of Chicago. Uh, my sister was two years older than I and was good friends with a young lady named Eartha Horwitz, Norma's sister-in-law. They were both refugees. They had come in question. They had uh, their first daughters almost exactly at the same time, so they were close friends. And one day when I went back to my sister's apartment, there was a note saying she is at uh, her friend's house. Uh, she and, and her husband, Bert, lived in a uh, World War II barrack set up for graduate students at the University of Chicago. And so I went over there, and there it was Norma. It happened to be a, a Thursday afternoon. I remember it clearly. Uh, I was leaving Saturday morning back to Illinois. So uh, she looked, she was very attractive, very uh, charming and outgoing. And so we, I managed to beg one date from her. We went to a movie house on, on 53rd Street. And then uh, we started corresponding and made plans that we would uh, marry in, seven, in three and a half years when I was finishing. Uh, my bachelor's degree, and some older friends said that was a silly idea, and so we con condensed that and got married in '55. Oh, wonderful story. Okay, and so you've been married how many years? Uh, seven, six, six, seven, sixty-eight. Sixty-eight years. Yep. Congratulations to and, both uh, to both of you. So you mentioned you came out. Uh, refugee from, from Europe after the war, you had to serve in the United States Army. How yes. did that come about? Uh, I, I, in signing the uh, uh, intention to apply for citizenship, uh, that implied that I am in t intending to, that I am available for, available for the draft. For draft. And, uh, and 19... Healthy 19-year-old arriving, uh, no college deferment, no family hardship. The board was delighted to, yes. to welcome me. Well, that's, that's also a noble of you to, to do that. And uh, of course, that was a draft in those days. We don't yes. have a draft today. But yes. young men had to face a draft. The Korean War, I believe, was, yep. was going on and had to be drafted. Uh, what, what attracted you to engineering? You went, you went to school when you got out of the Army. Why did you pick, uh, why did you pick uh, civil engineering? The, uh, I wanted to be a bridge engineer, that's the short answer. Uh, I was hesitating between the arts, uh, not necessarily performing uh, fine arts, but uh, critics, historian, whatever. Uh, that was my mother's influence. 
uh, and mechanical things that, because I was in, interested. I applied, I looked into the uh, architecture schools. They were very old fashioned. Uh, the first year of uh, the Mozart school, there was no, no subject other than freehand drawing. And I had just finished my, my math option in the French baccalaureate. I was interested in math, so I was looking for something that combined those two. Uh, a distant cousin uh, sent me two books, sent two American books. I was still in Paris. One was uh, a uh, biography of a Swiss engineer who made some fabulous concrete bridges in the, in the 30s and 40s. The other one was an exhibit from the Museum of Fine Arts on uh, bridges as art, and really discussing the first book that discussed the subject of aesthetics of bridges. And those two things that I read in the summer of 1950 convinced me that structural engineering would be the two things that brings it together. Wow. Uh, you, uh, we often hear about uh, individuals overcoming obstacles. And your great career, uh, you had to overcome them, especially when you were younger. Um, I saw that between 1941 and 1945, you experienced, I think I'm quoting here, two occupations in Europe, uh, and, um, in, in Yugoslavia where you were, two ghettos, three train rides in sealed boxcars, three concentration camps, and a 65-mile death march to Buchenwald. Uh, you were finally liberated by the U.S. Army in April of 1945. That, that, and then you had to have the, uh, the commitment to go on and, and do what you did. What, what, what uh, reinforced you at that time? What, what gave you the, the belief in the future, the future? Well, I wanted to create a career, forget about the camps and the starvation and the filth and degradation. Uh, uh, and uh, I just knew I had to do something to, to get away from that spirit. So the uh, loss of my parents was, was very hard. Uh, uh, returning back into, uh, by then, uh, Soviet influence, communist Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. called the, uh, referred to as the P workers' paradise, where I was informed that because of my uh, experiences, I would be allowed to finish academic high school, but under no condition would any university in the country accept me as a student, because after all, I was the son of a bourgeois, and the school mm -hmm. universities are, are reserved for sons of proletarians. Mm -hmm. and, and I had, couldn't fake a proletarian background, so uh, it was dead dead street there, and so my sister and I escaped and got out, got out from behind the Iron Curtain, and, uh, and that fact, I think, gave us the momentum to go and, on. And you were 14 or 15 years old then, okay. right? Yep, yep. That's incredible. Uh, the world must have looked so bleak to you at that time. Uh, well, three years in Paris was bleak. Uh, we didn't have much to eat. Uh, very often the meal was uh, what the street vendors were selling, a, a kilo of boiled potatoes and half a kilo of fresh dates okay. for the two of us. You, just you and your sister were there? Yes. Uh, but Paris is Paris. And Sunday morning the Louvre is open, and every Sunday morning I walk to the Louvre and spend the day looking at art. So it wasn't that bad. Okay. Uh, um. What advice can you give others to overcome obstacles? I mean, nothing compared to what you went through, but still to achieve their dreams. What, what advice would you give young people who maybe have had a difficult time? Uh, my, my advice always is to, to look forward and not to look back. Uh, yeah, very good. One step forward. Uh, yeah. Right, very good. Uh, and. Um, 
So now I'd like to look at uh, your, what I call your brilliant career, and it really is brilliant. Uh, if you reflect back on, on your professional life, what uh, professionally you think are your one or two most important achievements in, oh. in engineering? Well, if I may skip the, the term professional for a second, the foremost achievement is our four children. They, yes. they are living, they're carrying through everything that we had expected of them, and we are just inordinately proud of them. Very good. Technically, uh, uh, I think the, the uh, push that I've been able to exercise in moving structural engineering from the slide rule age to the computer age uh, is, is what I'm best known for. Yes, I know that from, uh, from talking with you and from, from uh, what I read. Um, so the, 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 you're moving, you were one of the first individuals, uh, very prominent in, in using computation computers uh, to design uh, structures. That's right. right. No, there were many, many people uh, went into it, uh, computerized every manual procedure, no matter how primitive and how mm -hmm. approximate and how idealized, but they were scattered. Uh, nothing worked on more than one computer, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, I managed to pull together uh, all of the standard structural types, uh, pulled together techniques from uh, electrical engineering, many other areas for uh, uh, efficient computation of that across the full range of size. My motto was that small, small problems should not be penalized for the program's capability of doing large things when those, those capabilities were not used. And uh, uh, impressed particularly by Charlie Miller of uh, MIT, uh, uh, a problem-oriented problem language, language so that the people could communicate with the computer as they wo would with a professional colleague rather than remembering key notes and key uh, it, digital entries that specified the problem. Yeah. When you cut back your, your outputs uh, two or three days after you put it in, the first thing you had to do is go to the user manual and find out what you did, because you had forget, forgotten whether three stands for elastic analysis or plastic analysis, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I managed to put this together. Charlie Miller invited me to, to uh, uh, MIT to spend a year there. He located two uh, finishing graduate students, uh, both on Ford Fellowship, postdoc fellowship, both as anxious as me in getting rid of the subject of our PhD thesis and do something together, mm -hmm. something new. And we put that group together, and in one year we got uh, the program going. Yeah. It, it's you, not a particular program, but, but that union of all of the problems. Uh, at, that, at that time, at, at uh, old Carnegie Tech, there was a professor, George Bujarello, you, you know him very yes, well. Yes, George Bujarello, uh, any he, member of George He was Bujarello. working in hydraulic engineering. He produced a, a list of 137 subroutines needed to cover all of hydraulic engineering. I never counted what I wanted to replace, uh, and, but I knew I wanted to replace them all. And I owe it to uh, uh, credit to one of my colleagues at MIT who, uh, who said, there's no point in doing this. Uh, if there are 137 routines, 135 of them are approximations, idealizations of the real thing and they're all developed because that's what could be handled in manual computation. And that none, none of those were needed if they had a formal 
the uh, basis on which to do the problem. And so all of those came together very early in the computer history. Uh, the term uh, killer app has not yet been invented, mm -hmm. but uh, stress, the program was called Stress Courtesy of Norma. Uh, 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 companies, state highway departments, were beginning to buy a particular computer just because it ran stress. Mm -hmm. That's the definition today of a killer app. Mm -hmm. Something, uh, a program you buy, a program which makes you buy the computer that can run that program. And you've seen, uh, as your work evolved, a million-fold increase in the speed and data storage of computers. I mean, you were working uh, back speed, in Speed, data storage, et cetera, 60s. et cetera. But veracity, uh, the, uh, accuracy, precision, uh, real-life modeling, uh, that was the basic, not just speed and, and, and capacity, but a, a true modeling of how a structure behaves under loads. Yes. Uh, you also, I believe, work with the famous uh, structural engineer and architect uh, Fosley Kahn uh, on the Hancock building, right? You yes. were telling me that. Now, Fos was very uh, generous in his article on the uh, design of the tower. He credits me with assisting with the design. Mm -hmm. I did no such thing. I had the only program uh, capable of handling fully three-dimensional analysis of the structure. And for that uh, configuration that he had selected, that was very important because nobody else, no, uh, nobody else outside of the uh, military and the <coughs> aircraft industry had a program that to do that. They did so. All my program did is to to uh, uh, verify the design assumptions that they had made. The program, I mean, the structure stood because of what they, what they designed. I think no more than about 10 members were, had to be changed sli mm -hmm. slightly. That. So uh, it was just a confirmation. Problem-oriented language had nothing to do with it. The problem was so large that they had small programs that generated the input data for, for the big analysis. But, uh, but uh, it, was, it was overly generous. Then. Yeah, and that's a landmark building at the time, one of the tallest buildings in the United oh, yeah. States. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, in, especially in Chicago. When, yeah. when a very, very uh, respected structural engineer gave a talk at, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at uh, uh, Illinois Society of Structural Engineers and said, Steve's program says the building will stand. I say the building will fall. Oh, yeah, nice, nice, nice sentence. Uh, my contact at the, uh, the AE firm calls, uh, what, what can we do? I said, it's very simple. Uh, I know that they only have a, a space thrust assumption, no, no moment carriage. Uh, they, they don't have a, a state frame where all the bending and torsion is also carried. Uh, you change one statement in, the, in, my, in my program, and you can duplicate their results to at least see if you're talking about the same thing. Hour later, comes back in the conversation. Well, he is a very good friend of the partners. I can't get the $2,000 to verify his stuff. Uh, uh, I said, well, I have nothing I can help. And, and so uh, they continued the construction. and. And it has worked ever since. Well, the building is still standing. Yes. In fact, and I it's have very a, close to my home I, in Chicago. Until his death, I had a, a standing o offer for a, for a position with that engineer's firm. Yes. That was, uh, that was back in the uh, 60s, 60s, right? yes. I was yeah. still at Illinois. So uh, you've seen then the evolution of uh, tall buildings in the meantime, right? Um, Amazing what can be Absolutely. done. Absolutely, yes, uh, yes, and it it uh, it enabled uh, structures that you couldn't 
the dream was uh, manual computation or slideful computation. Right. And and you know the first first generation uh, analyzed by computers were still uh, boxes, columns, floors, and cut out, a cut off at top. And then out of nowhere came this proliferation of of uh, move, uh, uh, silhouettes of different styles, uh, projections that didn't exist, cubes placed at different angles. None of those things would ever be done, could ever be done by hand calculation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, that leads me to today we're, we're talking about generative AI. I'm sure you have some interest in this or follow. Yeah. Uh, do you see things like generative AI being a uh, help to designers of, uh, and engineers of yeah. structures? As, as you know, I had very good friends in the AI community at uh, Carnegie Mellon. I use many of their tools. They're much better than ordinary debugging tools, etc. Uh, I have a uh, reluctance to accept the present generation as artificial intelligence, uh, as learning programs. My understanding of learning to do something also means understanding, learning to understand why I'm doing this. And without this background of rationality or uh, uh, that undergirds the creative act, there's also this analytical activity of understanding what happened. And AI tools don't do that now. They work on similarities from statistical similarities on past results or past gener artificially generated results. They can embellish whatever, but they do not create. It's not creative, no. which is an essence of engineering, creativity. Which, uh, yes. There will be labor. Look, I started as a programmer in, in 1957 in a company that was formed by unemployed engineers during the Depression. They were very concerned about my work, writing a program for designing piers supporting bridges. Uh, coffee was often spilled on my desk, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's no question, enormous uh, replacement of uh, skills and activities resulted from computerization of these tasks. And that continues at higher and higher level and that threatening more and more people. Mm -hmm. But that this is a job killer and before that we had a paradise of, of, uh, uh, of labor support is just, just not true. And it doesn't replace the creative mind of a, yeah. an engineer or person. Right. Um, well, uh, it's, um, looking back, so back over the past uh, 45 years, even a member of the National Academy of Engineering for, uh, I think, um, 40, 47 years, right. right? Yep. Okay, 47 years. Um, and uh, when you, what did you feel like when you got learned you were uh, elected? What were, do you remember uh, that? Yes. Uh, it's a Monday morning. A conference starting in that uh, hotel in Roslyn that overlooked the river. Uh, uh, in Virginia, Roslyn, yeah, Virginia. Uh, Harold, uh, they got, uh, he was at, at that time at, with the Office of Naval Research, later, later uh, had a tenure as president of NAE, about which I gather you don't talk about very often. But he was the conference chair and I was the opening keynote speaker. And as, as he led me to the uh, podium, he said, did you get the letter? Did you get the letter? The letter. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Had some suspicion what it was. I stumbled on the, uh, on the platform and totally blew my speech. <laughs> uh, time, no notion of time, no notion of subject, nothing. It was very embarrassing. And as a, all I could do is uh, get, get off the podium, uh, uh, 
call up my, uh, the department secretary, please go to the mailbox, see if I have a letter from NAE. Uh, she comes back a minute later. Yes, there is a letter. You just have been appointed to something else. Those were her exact words. <laughs> and I said, oh, nice. Please uh, call Norma, tell her that, and tell her that I'm busy with committees that I won't be able to call her till mid, till mid afternoon. Well, that was. So you still remember that? Uh, I day. remember that yeah, very clearly. Yeah, we, we all have that feeling when we, we found out because most of us didn't know we were even nominated. Yeah. You know, at the time, and uh, that must have been quite a quite a feeling. Yeah. Um, but, but such an embarrassment. Yeah. And I, my younger colleagues who were at that at that meeting occasionally still refer to to that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, what do you think uh, is the most important role the National Academy of Engineering can play in, yeah. in shaping engineering, engineering practice and engineering education? I was thinking about that question. First of all, I think the uh, NAE being a route of elevation and eventually reward for excellence in engineering is in itself a very useful, very important function. You mean to highlight the achievements uh, uh, of engineers yes, and their excellence? Have a, give a target to strive for by the younger people as they rise and uh, give the examples. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's extremely important. Those young people prob probably don't know about the internal ba battles that are going on in the nomination committee, that's fine. They just see the, the, proper, the proper people rewarded. I think that's a very important thing. Uh, on, for the working members of the committee, I think the charter of being of uh, uh, usefulness, assistance, guidance to the nation, that is that should be followed, uh, followed much more intensely than it's done now. Not sit around waiting till some agency contacts you. To be more proactive. Be a lot more proactive. Yes, yes, that's a discussion we have. That's that. That's what's needed. Yeah. Right now, there's very little of it. Uh -huh. um, well, I, I think that that over the years, many of the reports have that we've done in the National Academy, oh, including yeah. all three academies, yes, and the yeah. volunteers, members yeah, yeah. and non-members yeah, of the academy, then, then have, had, have had some impact. Some have not, others have. But uh, I'm uh, not belittling any of that, but uh, it, the impetus, the initiative, came from uh, potential clients rather than the uh, academy as a unit uh, Soliciting so and maybe the NE itself has to develop a, a seeding process or something of where can we contribute that maybe yep. the government oh, yeah, definitely. maybe the government hasn't seen yet hasn't run into definitely uh, AI might be a, an example well, of that because there are some things happening yeah the NAEM reports are important and a lot of members are involved and uh, you constantly advertise for for new positions <laughs> let, let me. Uh, uh, I'm to draw to a close here with the, something I think is important. Uh, you know, I engineers often are reluctant to talk about what the field has done, um, and uh, maybe the public doesn't understand. I mean, if you just count the impact of engineering on society, if you made a list every day you walked in of how, what engineering imp has impacted you, it'd be a very long list every day as you go to work yeah. or come home in this. One of the storytellers we had, who was also a very, very good engineer, was Henry Petrosky. Yeah. And unfortunately, Henry passed away recently. Right. Uh, he, he wrote uh, 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 articles for the American Scientist, wrote 10 books. His book on the essential engineer is fantastic. Did you know Henry? And, and very what well. Do you think, what do you think he was his, about his legacy years, will be? He was about 40 years behind me. And he was uh, a PhD student in the uh, theoretical and applied mechanics division. Well, you were a faculty member at Illinois. Well, I, I was in recent PhD, just mm -hmm. on the faculty. 
So we frequently crossed paths uh, and uh, chatted. And over the years, we corresponded. I, I, was, I think I had all of his books. I, I was very impressed uh, with the, the way he presents the, the material. And it's very important to do so. The, on, uh, the only person I can compare him, uh, but that uh, it was his second one is much more technical, is uh, Mario Salvadori. Mm -hmm. why, the buildings, why buildings stand up and oh. why buildings fall down. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Salvadori was, a, was a, a scientist much more than an engineer. And he, he gives much more technical explanations than, than Henry, but uh, he has popularized it. So I, I think that's very, very important. Uh, there was a early uh, NAE member, uh, a contractor. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name. He, he, he had a book on pleasure of engineering, et cetera. Uh, but he, he, he talked mostly about management and moving people rather than what the people do. But uh, yes, we need more. We need more Henry Petrovsky. It was a big loss. Yes. Uh, we need storytellers uh, yes. who have actually done it themselves, yes. too. Yes. And, and our engineers. Yeah. And Henry was certainly a giant in, in that yeah. field. Um, so as we, we conclude our interview, uh, uh, anything you want to say to your colleagues, uh, not just civil engineering, but engineering in general, um, for uh, especially younger ones? Uh, um, uh, well, the uh, one thing that's important is the is what you leave behind. Uh, Norma attended an art appreciation course, and her teacher flatly said, "If an artist didn't start a school, he didn't contribute to art." Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a little too rough a statement. Uh, engineering is too big and it's too complex. Uh, in individual uh, contributions have always been rare, much, much rarer than uh, in science. Uh, and they're going to be rarer. Uh, that's, uh, that's a foregone conclusion. But yet, uh, once you get to the level of any membership, you ought to start thinking about uh, uh, what, uh, what effect it will have on your work will have on the next generation uh, and what leadership is required to foster that. Uh, in, in, Academia is sometimes much more difficult than in industry because it's much more set and uh, in traditional ways. But uh, it's very important for uh, for people to uh, to think of what what comes of of their work and how that will influence and and motivate younger generations and what they leave behind. Yep. as an engineer is yep. truly important. Yep. Legacy. You certainly left a lot of good things behind. It's been a true honor for me to know you over the years and a privilege. And um, I, I learned a lot from you and from our cohorts in the, uh, in the carpool. In the carpool, yeah. Uh, and yeah. It, it, it's, uh, uh, you're right. Uh, yeah. uh, these uh, awards and so on are aspirational and cause young people certainly affected me to see someone like yourself. Uh, your great leader, uh, Stephen, it's been a total pleasure. And I want to thank you for, for joining me today. And, uh, uh, and I look forward to our continued conversation. Well, thank you for having me here. Thank you very much. And now that after 30 some years, we are back together in the yes. same yes. niche, yes. Uh, yes. we'll continue this friendship. Yes. Yeah. Thank, and thank I'm, li you. I'm listening more now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.